Logan. Today I want to focus on a portion of this verse. Um, <clears throat> last time that I ministered, I ministered on Mark 3.13 and 14. And we looked at the fact that Jesus, remember he had called 12 men that they should be with him. And, but that wasn't the only reason. It wasn't just so that they could sit next to Jesus. Remember it says, He ordained twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach, to say something. And they have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Now you find out really quick when you get with Jesus, he always gives you something to do. Jesus really... Those that are in Christ, see, there, there's not really any place in Christ for idleness. Does my father, does hitherto work, and, and I work. I, I'm busy. I'm busy about what? Doing my father's pleasure. I'm here to do what the father sent me to do. Well, those that are in Christ, see, they've been given something to do. There is a message that has to be proclaimed. Now, God's going to use his people to pray, proclaim this message. This is what he's going to do. Jesus had chosen these men to be his apostles, and he had ordained them. He set them apart for a certain use. And everyone that's in Christ has a certain use. Now it's not all the same. Somebody already brought this up. You're in a body. Not all the members are the same, but they are members in particular. They all, they all have a function. Uh, there's not any, um, there's not any um, obsolete members of the body. He, has, he put them there for a reason. God's very organized. I mean, think, think of it. Just look up to the heavens. If you ever wonder, is God organized? Just look up. Look what he's done. It's a representation just of his, of his sheer power. But look what he's done in the body of Christ. See, this is for the ages to come. This is going to be under extreme scrutiny by those who are much wiser and mightier in power than us, and they're not going to find anything wrong with it at all. He's done all things well. Now today, I want to talk a little bit about God's choice. So you hear a lot about choice in the, in the world today. You hear a lot about choice. You have a right to choose. Well, okay, God has a right to choose too. God has chosen, there's some things that God has chosen from the foundation of the world before he ever made the world. There's some implications. When Jesus says that I, I have ordained 12 that they should be, there's some implications to that. All right, I want to look at some of those implications today. I want to answer this question. Primarily, I wanted to answer it for myself, but it's good. I'll share it with you. Why, why do I want to preach on this verse? Why, why, what am I trying to accomplish? What is the purpose of, of standing up and proclaiming that God is the one that does the choosing? Until a person understands that it's God that's working in them, both the will and the do of his good pleasure, they're not really going to get a lot done. I'm talking about got a lot done in laying down your life. Remember Jesus said, Unless you take up your cross and follow after me, you cannot be my disciple. So the question is, what is it going to do? What is it going to get? What, what's it going to take for you to lay down your life, to take up your cross, and follow after Jesus? Because until that's done, really, all this is just, just like a social club. Until you lay down your life, until you're dead to yourself, in other words and you're living with Jesus or for Jesus, or the inclinations of your, your mind and your heart are orchestrated or led or by Jesus himself, you're not doing anything eternal. It's just a bunch of noise, a bunch of static down here that's going on, whatever you're doing. It's not going to pass on to eternity. You're not working as in view of eternity. Actually, your trials are calculated to be harder than you can bear in the flesh. And this is on purpose. This is actually a mercy by God. You can't handle the trial. But if Jesus is in you, if Jesus, if he that which is in you is greater than he that is in the world. This is a fact. 
But now it has to be established as Jesus in you. And I'm saying it has to be established to you. Yeah. You have to be, be, come to the point where you know that it's not I that lives, but Christ in me. Now, when that happens, you'll overcome the trial. When that happens, and until that happens, you're just kind of like floundering around like a fish out of water. You don't really have any purpose until Christ is in you. Now you have a hope of glory. Now, I'm in this, you know, it's, it's, we live in a day when this, this water has been so muddied up about choices. That it's almost a shame that I have to say what I'm getting ready to say. I'm not attempting to limit God's atonement. You have all these words out there. But at some point in time, you got to get around to what Jesus said. And you listen to Jesus very long, and he comes over this over and over and over. I, you have not chosen me. You have not chosen me. But I have chosen you. Now, these are hard words for some people, but they don't have to be. We should never draw back from anything that Jesus said. Amen. If it's something that Jesus said and it chafes against what you believe, then throw away what you believe because Jesus is right. Amen. Until you're aware that it's Christ in you, that's enabling advancement in God's kingdom, then making advancement will be minimal at best. And it's my proposition that the only advancement you're going to make until you're aware that Christ is in you is the advancement to realize that Christ is in you. This has got to be made before any event. Why? Because if you could make advancement without Christ, then what is the point of Christ? No, it's got to be, you got to see him for who he is. And when you do, laying down your life won't be such a hard task anymore. When you see that what, what, what Satan has really propagated is a lie. I really don't have any life down here. I really don't have any life independent from Christ. What I have is a bunch of misery. It's a horrible pit. And well, you've been delivered from it. So the apostles, I'll call you back to remember that. Remember when you were delivered. Because at that point in time, initially when you first came into the kingdom, there wasn't anything that was going to stop you from getting to God. Nothing. Satan didn't have anything he could offer you that could stop you from coming to the Lamb. Why? Because there's an inclination, and this is what we're going to talk about today, that was put in your heart that didn't come from the world came from God. And see, this is new birth, this new life. When he gives it to you, there, there isn't anything in the world that, that, that can, can, can subjugate that. It's from God, and it's unto God. Initially, when men respond in faith to the message of the gospel, there's a sense in which they have very little difficulty in overcoming the flesh. Well, let me say, this is a limited time offer. You don't take this and grow, you're going to die. See, he, he brings you into Christ, and it's like you're in a safe zone all of a sudden to where you can see things rightly. You say, that's the world, and I don't want anything to do with it. That's the world. Yeah, but wait a minute. Look at all these great things. They're not great. How can you make that determination? Because he puts you in Christ. There's no sin in Christ. There's no love for the world in Christ. Love for the world's down here. It's in flesh. The lust of the flesh. That's what, that's what it's all about, being a fallen, a fallen world. You live in an environment that hates God. How are you going to overcome it? you got to get in Christ. And how's that going to happen? God's got to do that. God's got to put you in Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit, at that point in time, at the point in time when you first believed, when you first became aware of the things that way there, they really are that way all the time. But you became aware of it. The Holy Spirit had been effective in convincing you of a few things. These are foundational things. But the Holy Spirit was almost, almost instantaneous. You knew that God was right and I'm wrong. He's right. He said, I'm a sinner. And I'm, if he's right, he's holy. I'm not holy. These things became very evident. That the world was evil, and it was worthy of throwing away. I looked out, I surveyed the world, and I said, no, I don't want that anymore. What happened? The Holy Spirit convinced me of sin. It also convinced you that heaven was worth fighting for. 
It was worth, I'll lay down my life if I can just obtain eternal glory with Christ. See, a lot's happened that moment that you first believed. You also determined that it was something that you actually wanted to do in laying down your life and taking up your cross. This was something nobody had to talk you into taking up your cross when you first came into the kingdom. This was something you were willing to do. I laid down my life because I'm getting something much greater than my life. I'm getting Christ's life in me. Now, initially, as I've already said, believers have no problem with these very fundamental issues. In order for you to have any problem with them, you have to be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Remember when it was preached to you. There's power in that remembrance. The apostles will call you back. Remember that in former days when you were first illuminated. Remember that. Why? Because there's power. Something was given to you on that day, that moment, that flesh could never impute to you. Mankind never could give you this kind of insight. Basically, today, my aim is ministering from this truth is to once again, see, this is what we do for each other, to heighten our awareness of what happened at that moment. See, this is this is critical, critical. Peter said they have forgotten that they were purged from their old sins. And what happened? They become involved in new ones. They forgot. It's critical. We're living in a time when forgetting is easy. You look away, and you'll find yourself out in, a, in the middle of forgetfulness. I didn't even remember. Well, see, these things are true, and they need to be brought up again. The same one who calls, chooses, he elects, he sanctifies, he tries, he scourges, he justifies, and if the process is not aborted by unbe- through unbelief, He's going to glorify together with Christ. The same one from the very beginning has been involved in the entire process. He's the one. He's the one that needs to be exalted, not the one who responds. I'm I'm going to be demonstrative about this, that it's God's kingdom and it's his inclination that he puts in you and you respond in faith. And you glorify God. Why? Because he's the one that initiated it. The foundation of the truth of of, of what I just said is in the scriptures all over the scriptures. You have not chosen me, but I have not. But you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now, see, that's the kind of like the the blanket, the thought I want to start off with and let that blanket be. Everything I want to say is going to fall under this. God's the prime mover in salvation. Mm-hmm. Now, really, really, when you think about it, this is not so hard to, to believe. I mean, how many inclinations do you know of anyway that a dead person has? If you took one out to the graveyard and you dug up a dead person and you ask them, what would you like for lunch? Would, would you really ever get a response? Does this dead person have an inclination to eat? Or to do anything. So see, it's not really, it's not out of the realm of, of our capacity to reason that dead people cannot respond to the living. They can't. It's a, they don't have a capacity, in other words. In order for this to happen, the, the dead person is going to have to be given a capacity that's greater than the flesh can supply. Yeah. Chosen. Now, its primary sense is to select or make a selection or to make a choice. Now, the point of Scripture and the point that Jesus is making is that you weren't the one. The the choice that was made, that God made, superseded the choice that you made. Now, you have not chosen me. Now, how, you know, this is... This is baby language. You have not, I mean, is that hard? That's not hard to understand. You have not chosen me. There was never a time when, by the nature, by the nature of flesh, that you would ever come to the conclusion is that I'm going to choose God. 
You take God out of the picture and none of us would have chosen God. None of us. None of us would have said, you know what? This Jesus is a pretty impressive personality. I'm going to give up my life now and I'm going to follow him based on my choice. Now, Jesus is making it abundantly clear. And I know some people say, well, he's just talking to his apostles. Well, okay. Let's take it from that, from that view now. Jesus is making it abundantly clear to his disciples that they are not the source of the call. Isn't that what he said? You haven't chosen me. I've chosen you. And ordained you. There was not some kind of a mixture between their choice and God's choice. Now, I know you'll be surprised to, to hear that this is a lot of doctrine is this. It's painted like, really, see, God's cast his vote, and Satan down here, he's cast his vote, and now you have the deciding vote. Is that right? Could you possibly fit that into what Jesus said? No. Some are willing to agree that this was the manner of how Christ chose his disciples. Now, you look at the context, and you could build an argument He's talking to his apostles here. He's not talking, bringing anybody else into this picture. Now, see, they'll agree to that. They'll say, yeah, when it comes to his disciples, this is how God chose them. And yet, at the same time, they'll say, well, this isn't how he chooses everybody now. Now, we've gone a little too far, a little overboard, if you start thinking that this is how God works with everybody. Jesus is not presenting anything new to his disciples when he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. This isn't like something new. This is what God's done from the very beginning. This is how God is. God makes choices. I mean, he, we, we call it his, or he calls it his eternal purpose. Things that he purposed in Christ Jesus before the foundation. There are some things that he was, he was going to do. Now, okay, let's compare this, this thought that you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Let's compare this thought to John chapter 1, 11 through 13. Now, I'm going to just kind of walk through this because this, Jesus says some, I mean, the, John says some things here <clears throat> that you can tell were precipitated by being with Jesus. By listening to the things that Jesus said, Holy Spirit's going to work through John. Now, he's going to give us, he's, he's going to outline this in such a simplistic way, and yet it's profound. Kind of would cast down a lot of false doctrine if people just believe what it says right here. You don't have to come up with excuses why it's this way. This is a proclamation. This is the way it is. Now, he came into his own, and his own received him not. Now, flesh, even sanctified flesh, is still flesh. Now, you can take, he came into his own. You would think if there was anybody, any people in the history of the world that would have been able to see this is the Christ, it would have been them. He cultured this nation. This nation had been taken by the hand. This was a supernatural nation. They wouldn't even be here if God had not opened the womb of Sarah and given Abraham Isaac, right? It's a supernatural. Isaac is supernatural. Didn't come from the flesh, in other words. This was God's work. And now, here are the descendants. Christ comes on the scene, and, and they, don't, they don't even know who he is. He came into his own, and his own received him not. Now, this is what we're talking about today. We're talking about receiving, being able to receive. Here's what he says. He came into his own. His own didn't receive him. It's popular to talk about, be, about receiving Christ, isn't it? We live in a day when you just lift up your hand, scratch your nose, make an inclination, and you've received Christ. Is that right? Is it even possible now, God cultured these people. These were God's people now. So, see, God's showing us something here. That flesh, even if it's sanctified flesh, is flesh. Yeah. Flesh and blood cannot comprehend the kingdom of God. It cannot. It isn't like if it's, we'll work with them a little bit more. And maybe they'll come. No, they cannot receive the things of God. Can't. It's higher. It's of a different dimension. And this reception is of a different dimension too. The reception of Christ is of a different dimension than flesh. Can't do it. 
God's proven this truth. Now, he's shown us in his people. He took them by the hand. He led them. And what did he say? What did Moses say about them? All this time, been a stiff-necked, hard-hearted people. You've resisted. You've resisted. God's tried and tried. He's showing us something about flesh. In other words, see, in Christ, you can start thinking, I'm doing pretty good. Flesh, that's flesh. You say, ah, I, I'm making some good advancements. Well, yeah, that may be so, but it wasn't you. It wasn't the flesh. It wasn't anything that you got from Adam that caused that advancement. It's Christ in you. And this is what has to be highlighted. Amen. Even how about if we just, we'll take a, we'll spend a few thousand years culturing a nation. And then I'll send my Messiah and they'll, they'll receive him, right? They'll, they'll look, no, they won't. He came unto his own and his own received him not. All right. John continues. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we have a problem. God has a problem with the reception of Jesus. Now, I say that that way because if anybody's going to receive Jesus, God has to become involved in it. Now, Jesus said this. This is simple. Jesus said this. He says, no man cometh unto the Father but by the Son, right, or through the Son. No man, you don't, you don't even know who the Father is, but the Son knows who the Father is, right? And he'll reveal him to as many as, as he will. Now, this thought, though, see, the, the whole point is the reception. What, do you, what really do you think about Jesus? Really, that is going to be the bottom line. Really, who do you say that he is? Who, see, because it's your reception of Jesus is what's going to make any difference whether or not God is inclined towards you or not. The reception. We have a reception problem. The flesh has a reception problem. It can't see Jesus for who he is. Now, some will argue at this point that, oh, wait a minute. I thought man was created a free moral agent. I, this is what I, I believe this, that man is a free moral agent, and there isn't anything that God's ever going to do to violate his freedom. Now, is that true? Is it true that God won't do anything to violate your freedom. Well, if that is true, then we're all going to hell. That's just the way it is. Because there isn't anyone. Jesus said there is none good except one. Now why? Why do you say that? Because flesh has a problem. Flesh can't perceive the things of God. Flesh can't comprehend God. And yet, in the end, if you don't know God, if you're not like him, you're going to be cast into outer darkness. So something, God's got to do something now. If anyone's going to be saved, God has to enter into the picture. John 8, 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, whether or not they want to agree with it or not, it doesn't change the fact that man is not free. Now, I don't know, it's not that difficult to realize that if you're a servant, how many servants do you know that are free? They're servants. And if you've sinned, you're the servant of sin. In other words, you have to be delivered. See, Satan is your master. Remember, he said, they said, we're Abraham's seed. Jesus said, if you were Abraham's seed, then you'd come unto me. You'd receive me. But you can't receive me. Why? Because your father's the devil. And that's who you worship. Now, see, flesh has this dilemma on its hands. Is it can't receive Jesus. Going to have to have something done. Going to have to have a supernatural event occur if you're going to receive Jesus. Why? Because you're the servant of sin. That's why. You're, you're in a horrible pit. You have to have a deliverer. And this deliverance, you know, it comes through a message. You preach the gospel. My question is, who can respond? Who will respond? Well, there's a multiplicity of different ways of saying it. Bottom line, what Jesus is saying is those that God inclines to respond. Now, that may, that may upset some people, but you know what? Some people need to be upset. Some people need to see that 
salvation is of the Lord. And if that isn't the, if he isn't the prime mover, you are never going to respond in faith, ever. And the, the whole point today is that if you have responded in faith, now your confidence is that he chose me. If I have faith, it's not an accident. It's not a, a coincidence. He chose me. Now, with that confidence, you can overcome the world. The reception of Jesus or the ability to see him as the son of the living God is not possible independent from God's involvement. Now, we know this, and, you know, I've said the statement, but I borrowed it from Peter. Remember, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? He asked this question. This is the kind of questions he, Jesus asked his disciples now. Who do men say that I am? Uh, the son of man am. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Now, this is still going on today. In the church world, this is still going on today. People don't really know who Jesus is. He's a good man. He's a prophet. You'll get all kinds of answers. You ask people who Jesus is. Some say Elias or there's Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said, but whom do you say that I am? This is really the burning question. What do you think about Jesus? Simon Barjona st stood up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is what Jesus said. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. This didn't come from the flesh. There wasn't anything about his Adamic nature that brought this to the surface that really, I've had this in me the whole time, Jesus. I just, you brought it out of me. Is that right? It can't be right. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to him. Amen. Who revealed it? But my Father, which is in heaven. Okay, now we would say it different ways. He gave him to believe. Okay, he imputed unto him faith. See, the, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church. Now, now it's this persuasion. It's this acknowledgement of who Jesus is, not just saying the words, not just saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, but then going on and living your life as though you didn't believe that Jesus is the Christ. It, until you know who Jesus is, you really don't have anything from God. This is the beginning. It's on this foundation that I'm going to build my church that everybody that's added to the body of Christ is going to be because they, they know who I am. They don't know who I am. I'm not going to give them anything. I'm not going to feed them. They're not going to be enabled to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present generation. Why? Because they don't know who I am. Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my church on this profession or this ability to be able to know who I am. I'm going to call it a capacity. Now, These are the ones, in our text in John 1, these are the ones that he says, to them gave he power. Amen. These are to them are the ones who God's given to know who Jesus is. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now look at this, this word power here. It can mean a bunch of different things, but one of the meanings is the the strength or the capacity. Do they, they have the capacity to be able to progress Godward because of Christ. They have the power to become. In other words, they weren't born sons in the flesh. Remember, he's going to go over this in a second. They, man needed an ability that he didn't possess at birth. Now, you know... All this advancement the men have done in gene splicing, they're never going to be able to splice a gene in there that's going to enable them to know who Jesus is. It's not going to happen because it's not by flesh. Man needed an ability. Uh, this was like the God gene. <laughs> he had to be able to be able to perceive that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if they did, they would have the power. Okay, another word is authority. In other words, they would have the right. 
they would have, they would have the, the ability to be made sons of God. All right. These are special people. Now, I know that we're living in a world that doesn't like distinction. They want, we want fairness. We want fairness. Everyone's the same. We want everyone to be treated fairly and equitably and not anyone special anymore because we're all the same. We live in a democracy, and everyone has a free voice. Everyone could, we're all the same. Well, I'm sorry. He's talking about special people here. See, there's a sense in which all have sinned. Well, it's more than a sense. It's a reality. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? And we're born, and if no, there's no intercession at all, if nothing intercedes, we're all going to go to hell. Because they were born in this, in this state, this fallen condition, that we need to be delivered from. So the miracle is Jesus. The miracle is that anyone can be saved. Now what he's highlighting here is those that are, as opposed to those who are not. Now Isaiah 56, 4, talking about them now, them that believe on his name. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths. Yeah. L- listen to this. And choose the things that please me. There's a characteristic about God's people. There's something that they really do love. And take hold of my covenant. They have it. They, when it comes down to it, they really like to do the things I like. And they love my covenant. All right? Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than the sons and the daughter of daughters. I will give unto them an everlasting name, and they shall not be cut off. This is the thought. I want to capture the thought. There's a lot of things that you've been exempted from in this world. God's asked you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. He's asked you, you're going to have to crucify this flesh. We've all got it. We've all carried it around with us everywhere we go. But see, the the question is, is, if, if you're in Christ, if you're walking in the Spirit, there's a preference to where you actually come to have a hatred for the very thing that you once loved. Well, well, why? Because you're one of these special people. Now, I know some people, they may not like it that they're special. You know what? Jesus says, if the world hates you, just know this, it hated me first. Now, why does the world hate some people? Some people they hate because they're liars and murderers. But if, you're, if Christ is in you and the world hates you because of that, he says, well, then happy are you. Yeah. Well, why? Because you, the very fact that you're following after Christ has caused the hatred in some people. Well, praise God, that isn't the only thing. People don't only hate you. The people of God love you. Now, even to them, the gospel always reveals, always makes a distinction between two classes of people, those that believe and those who do not believe. The gospel is what reveals this. Now, see, we're told to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because we don't know who these are. See, Jesus told them, you haven't chosen me, but I've chosen you. But he hasn't told us every single person. He said, you go out and you preach the gospel. You be instant in season out. You reprove, rebuke, exhort with all and suffering. Why? Because you don't know where that word's going to fall. You preach it. Preach the word. Well, how do I know if somebody, if somebody believes? Well, they'll believe. They'll respond in faith. They'll come forward. They'll, you'll, you'll know if they believe. And if they do, whosoever will. When the gospel's preached, can you say amen to it? Well, you're on good ground. All right. Abraham, we know that things, believing has never been a simplistic thing in the scriptures. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him righteousness. We can go through the whole book of Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, and you see a hallmark of all the things that people done when they believed. When it comes right down to it, as I've already stated, there's only really two classes of people. Christ has broken down the middle wall partition between the Jews and the Gentiles. We know that. We just learned that. Again, there are only two classes of people, those who are just and those who are unjust. Those who've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb 
and those who have, don't even have a wedding garment on. Remember, they're going to kick them out. You know, what, how'd you get here without a wedding garment? So I climbed up over the wall. I came in another way. Bind him hand and foot and cast him out of the kingdom. There shall be weeping and gnashing. There's only two basic classes of people. When Jesus, when Jesus comes back, these two classes of people are going to be like highlighted. What a contrast on that day. Here, these are the ones that Jesus gave to believe. Now, see, some people want me to say that differently, but that's, isn't that what he said? You haven't chosen me. I've chosen you. On that day, there's going to be the people that God chose and the people that would not have this man to rule over me. Now, is that hard to receive? All right, let's look at this. Which were born, John continues, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Well, now, why does it say it like that? Why, why does the Holy Spirit express this very, very touchy situation in such precise language? Because if you don't know you're of God, you're not going to be able to handle what you're going through right now. It's just the way it is. If you don't know that underneath of the everlasting arms holding you up, why? Not because of your, what you did. Not because of the will of the flesh, but because of God. God's bringing home a people, not of blood. Well, we could spend a lot of time with that one. In order for you to believe, in order for you to, to come in to the faith, and which is highlighted in this text, it was God's involvement. Now listen to this, Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Zion, Elias says, who have believed our report? The message went out into the whole world. Right. Now we're talking about the message of a coming Messiah now. The message went out into the whole world. And they should have known. They should have been able to see Christ when he came on the scene. Paul's making a point. When he came up, they did not believe. Why didn't they believe? They should have been able to. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I, but, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I'll provoke you to jealousy by them which are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. But Elias is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that, that didn't ask after me. What happened? The ones that were, you would have guessed, these people are going to believe on Christ. They've been cultured by God. They didn't believe, and the Gentiles did believe. Why did God do it like this? To show that it's not by blood, not by the will of the flesh, and not by the will of men. This is God's choice we're talking about, Amen. and it shouldn't offend any of us to say it. This is what God's doing. He's bringing many sons to glory. And what we've just looked at today was just his choice. He made a choice before the world was ever made who he was going to bring home. And it was going to be those that he gave to Christ. Now, it's pretty, actually pretty simple when you see it. There was nobody that was ever going to be ready on their own. So God had to give some to Christ. Christ is building his, building his church with resources supplied by his father. He gave some to Christ. What did Christ do? Took away their sins, cleaned them up, see, sanctified them, worked in them, justified them. Someday he's going to say, here, Father, here's the things you gave me, these men. And now look what I've done to them. And his father will say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Look what you've done. Without spot, I don't find any fault in these at all. He'll say these are worthy. Why? Because Jesus did a work in them. See, we are talking about today. The judgment's going to glorify Christ's work. It's going to show what Christ did in these people. There, they started out just like the others, didn't they? What was the distinction between the two? From our standpoint, this is from our standpoint. It's a very valid standpoint. We would say they believed the gospel. That's what they, we would say. We heard the gospel. It sounded good to us. The gospel sounded good in our ears. And we responded in faith, and we gave glory to God. See, that's from our standpoint. That's from, our, from down here looking up. We say, we believe the record that God gave of his son. From God's standpoint, 
he would say, I chose them in Christ from the foundation of the world. Now, you know, this is getting, this, this, what I just said is getting beat up in the day we're living in, but I don't care. Jesus said it, and that makes it right. Amen. This is what Jesus said, John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. There's not one person that God has ever given to Jesus that's not going to be there. That's what he said. I just got to believe that. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now, I'm going to finish this up here. See, we would say it from this, from our view down here. We would say the same thing. We're saying the same thing now. Mark 16, 16. It's the same thing. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I just said the same thing. But, but see, it's from our standpoint. Our standpoint, we look at it, we, say, we believe the gospel. We, we, we got baptized. Why? What I won't commenting on is why did you do that? Why was you inclined to follow the Lamb? From this standpoint, from God's standpoint, because I gave them to believe. And you see how, how marvelous these two views are the same view. It's just different perspectives. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Mm -hmm. There's a very real repercussion when the gospel's preached. There's repercussions. And it, it, there's, there's a distinction that's, that's made that is so profound. But what if the gospel's not preached? What if you preach health and, and wealth? What if you preach you know, the psychological gospel that God really loves you all. He loves you all so much. God loves you all so much that there isn't anything you could ever do or anything you've ever done to make God love you any less. What if that's the gospel going out? What if it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ? What if it's just like a milksop kind of thing that God just, it just doesn't make any difference? Well, then there's no distinction. When you preach the gospel, the fact that Christ came down and God laid on him the iniquity of us all and he took it away and he rose from the dead and he's at God's right hand right now interceding for us. See, this changes people. What people? Amen. What people does that change? God says it changes them that believe the record that he's given of his son. In closing, I want to admonish everyone who hears my voice right now to be actively, now I know that you're doing this, but let's remind ourselves again. Be active in making your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never fall. See, if you can just keep what God, who God is, God's God. See, God's choices stand. But see, our choices as they're sanctified, as you're in Christ, and as you're walking in the Spirit, your choices actually become His choice. If you're in Christ Jesus, you've been made free. And whoever's in Christ, when Christ sets you free, you're free indeed. See, now, now you're actually free to be able to demonstrate God's power working in you, both to will and to do of its good pleasure. You see an inclination of your heart. You say, I want to do this thing for God. You're going to find out that this was God working in you. And see, now it sanctifies your whole life. Now, you are the body of Christ. Right now, God's already working in you. You're already the body of Christ and members in particular. Now, you know this is 1 Corinthians 12. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Being a part of this body of Christ. See, I don't know that it's been exalted to the place that God exalted it. He put you in the body of Christ. Why? That you could edify his people. That you could build one another up in your most holy faith. Why? Because we're headed to a place where all those who, who God's worked in, they're going to, well, you're going to have a name. You're going to be given a new name. 
And you're going to reign with Christ forever and ever. Right now, we're like in school. We're being tutored for eternity. And um, the message today, I, I really wanted to, to try to, to go over this again. God made the choice. Now, but see, now, once you're in him, it's like he opens the door. says, what, what do you do? What will you do today for Christ? What, what have you set your heart on today? See, as you're in Christ, your will is sanctified. And everything you do, you can do heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. And in this, see, God will be glorified by his people. I praise God for an assembly of saints. I mean, there's many. We don't know of all of them. There's many. Around the face of the earth, people gathering together in the name of the Lord to glorify him and to be built up in the most holy faith. Someday we'll get to meet them all. By his grace, we've met a lot of them. And I thank you, brother.